in here and uh, let's get us started. Um, oops. Well, now it won't let me go live on Facebook. So I will work on that. Um, but for those of us who are in the meeting right now, um, I want to thank you for, for joining us for our virtual event on the space race today. Evan is going to teach us all about getting to the moon, a tale of the Cold War, bringing a Nazis to America, and cutting corners. Um, I ask that you stay muted during the presentation, but at the end, Evan will answer questions from the audience. Um, at that time, you can unmute yourself to ask a question, um, or you can type your question in using the chat function. I'll read the questions out loud um, for Evan to answer. We, we'd like to, for you to stay muted during the presentation, but you are more than welcome. Uh, you are encouraged to turn on your camera so um, we can see your faces. After the presentation, I'm going to put a link to a feedback survey into the chat. Um, it, it's just a few questions. You should be able to just click on the link or you have to copy and paste it sometimes um, as a URL. But it's a very brief, um, just a few questions, and we really appreciate any feedback um, that you can give us. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Evan to tell us all about the space race. OK, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Samantha, for inviting me again to the library. And thank you for spending some time with me. Uh, I don't know what the weather is necessarily in the Cal, but I can tell you here in New York, it's sunny and it's rather nice. So uh, I thank you for uh, taking your time out uh, to spend some time with me. Uh, I am also going to thank somebody else, a guy by the name of Dick Hull, H-O-L-L. Uh, Dick Hull was part of NASA between around 1960 and 1974. He was part of the team down in Australia that brought the video back from the moon that you saw. And I do have a story from Dick uh, that uh, may startle you about that video. And I'm going to ask you about that uh, when I get to that story. But Dick, uh, who is now in his 80s, gave me an awful lot of information on this. And uh, my background is radio and TV. Uh, and I've dealt with two astronauts, uh, Thomas Stafford and Buzz Aldrin, um, over the years uh, as part of the people who I've interviewed. So, uh, and I was a kid of the 1960s who enjoyed watching uh, the lunar landing. And I thought it was all about going to space. I thought it was all about going to the moon. And uh, all about science and uh, all that uh, other uh, stuff. Uh, have I seen the dish? Well, Dick says that a good part of the, the dish was based on real life, but I'll tell you more about Dick uh, in a few minutes. But I thought that uh, going to space and going to the moon was all about science. Little did I know it was about missiles and the missile gap that John Kennedy campaigned on in 1960, that uh, there was a, a gap between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States in terms of how the Soviets had superiority in missiles. And I never realized that the space race was only a small part of what was going on, the Cold War, which started right after World War II and went into uh, the uh, 1980s and has reemerged. Uh, that is man on the moon. That is July of 1969. And there is John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy is at Rice University talking about going to the uh, moon. But uh, he said back in uh, May of 1961, we choose to go to the moon and these other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is the one we're willing to accept. One, we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win. He intended to win, but he didn't care about the space program. All he cared about was the first man and was going to be a man, was going to be a woman. The first man on the moon was an American. Uh, the Cold War competition, like I said about Kennedy, he wasn't too interested. Uh, in fact, there's a quote. Uh, I'm not that interested in space, he told the NASA administrator in a private meeting where he made clear that space priorities other than a, little, a lunar landing meant little to him as did arriving on the moon second. In fact, had Kennedy uh, not been assassinated in 1963, uh, there would have been a major fight about uh, money going into the moon program during the campaign of 1964. And Kennedy may have just 
well, you know what? It's a great goal, but there are things here on earth that we got to take care of. And he may have backed off that claim we need to get to the moon by the end of the decade. And there is Lyndon Johnson, and he's with uh, NASA's James Webb. And if it's the guy who uh, you're looking for that put Americans on the moon, it is Lyndon Johnson. He is the one who made sure that the money came in uh, for the um, Project Gemini, Project Apollo, and putting uh, man on the moon. Walter Cronkite, old iron pants, a uh, guy who I met twice uh, during my career. One, we only talked about him as a teenager in Houston playing hockey. Didn't talk about anything else. But anyway, the uh, former CBS News tanker Walter Cronkite did say that Johnson was the father of the program and claimed that no one did any more than LBJ to commit the U.S. to landing men on the moon and returning them home safely. And uh, there is Lyndon Johnson, who is no longer president by this point. Uh, he is the man on the left. He is looking up. And uh, he is uh, one of the VIPs at uh, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, during the launch of Apollo 11 on July 16th, 1969. I'm going to start with Apollo 11, then I'm going to work backwards and then forwards again. Uh, Apollo 11 got to the moon obviously, on July 20th, 1969. Neil Armstrong got down the uh, lunar uh, module along with Buzz Aldrin, and they walked around the moon for a little bit, got some rocks, and came home. Um, Neil Armstrong was a little apprehensive about this flight, um, not because he didn't want to do it. He wasn't that confident that uh, he was going to get back to Earth safely. Uh, a month before the launch of Apollo 11, we decided we were confident enough we could try an attempt on the descent to the surface. Uh, I thought we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth. 90%, 10% in this ad that I'm going to be killed on this. This is a suicide mission. Uh, but only a 50-50 chance of making a landing on that first attempt. Uh, and Armstrong continued. He said there were so many unknowns on that descent from the lunar orbit down to the surface that had not been demonstrated yet by testing. After all, uh, the lunar module went within eight vertical miles of the moon back in May of 1969 with Thomas Stafford uh, in the control, but that's it. They did not go down to the moon and all the uh, testing that was done in uh, Iceland, and that's where a lot of testing was done because Iceland was about the only place on Earth that was like the moon. But anyway, um, he said it wasn't demonstrated and there was something in there, or there may have been something in there, big chance that there uh, was something in there we didn't understand properly. We would have had to abort and come back down or go back to earth without landing. And there is the Apollo crew um, walking through the uh, uh, aisle there on its way to, and the crew is on its way to the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, when Armstrong and Aldrin made their descent uh, aboard the Eagle, Columbia was the mother ship, to the moon's surface, the onboard computer had intended them to put them down on the side of a large crater with steep slopes, huge boulders. As Armstrong said, not a good place to land at all. And then Armstrong took over. He was an old pilot. I took it over manually and flew it like a helicopter out to the west direction took it to a smoother area without so many rocks and found a level area and was able to get it down there before we ran out of fuel. There was something like 20 seconds of fuel left. And if you uh, uh, ever watch the old uh, videos of the lunar landing, Charles Duke is uh, talking to the astronauts and he says, you got a bunch of guys who are about ready to turn blue. Well, somebody, and I was 13 years old when I watched that, I had no idea what they were talking about, absolutely no idea what they were talking about, nor did all the other people, um, because we didn't know they were about ready to run out of fuel. So they get on the moon, and um, that's one of the first things that's dropped on the moon, litter, garbage. Hmm, wonder if they got uh, a fine for littering and how much the fine is for littering on the moon. That is garbage. That's the first thing they dropped off. Um, it was a short 2.5 hour moonwalk. The astronauts uh, picked up all kinds of rocks, 47 pounds of rocks. Michael Collins, uh, who is still alive, 
uh, was in the command module and he was going around the moon and uh, he was uh, at any minute ready to uh, pounce on an opportunity if, if there was a need for a rescue. There were 18 different rescue procedures should something have failed on the surface. And there is Buzz Aldrin. Uh, who was the second uh, man on the moon. And the day I met him, he looked just like Georgie Jessup. He just, he had the stuff on his stuff and medals and all that other stuff. We're at the Waldorf Hotel in New York. Um, Aldrin or Armstrong, who is gonna be the first guy on the moon? Well, Buzz Aldrin had his way. He would have been the first guy on the moon simply because of the way the lunar module was set up. Uh, if you go to the uh, NASA history website, uh, the uh, Apollo expeditions to the moon, it tells a different story than what actually happened because NASA originally thought that Aldrin would be the first to pop out of the, uh, the lunar craft and uh, jot down the ladder and um, he'd be the first. But the way Grumman, Grumman uh, Corporation, which is not far from me over at uh, or was not far from me in Beth Page. It's not there anymore, but here's a library thing. Uh, one of the mock-ups of the lunar module sits in the Beth Page library, not far from uh, where Grumman used to be. And they, it's really a cool thing. You see this big lunar module mock-up and it's right in the middle of the library. Uh, and I guess if you go to their website, the Beth Page library, you could see that. Uh, I've spoken there. Uh, the hatch, getting back to the lunar module, the hatch that would open uh, up to let the astronauts out was on the opposite side of where Aldrin was sitting. So for Aldrin to get out, it would have been necessary for him with his bulky suit and his backpack to climb over near Armstrong or whoever was the commander at that time. And uh, when uh, they tried that um, in, in a rehearsal, uh, didn't work. Uh, it damaged the lunar module mock-up. Uh, that is Neil Armstrong's long shadow, a picture taken uh, by Buzz Aldrin of the eagle, which is uh, on the moon. Uh, Aldrin, uh, in all, and this is what uh, he said, in all previous missions, if someone, a crew member, was to spacewalk, it was always the junior person, not the space commander who would stay inside. I felt there was an obligation on my part to put forth the reasons why a commander who had been burdened down with an enormous amount of responsibility and training for activities should stay inside. Aldrin didn't win that fight. They gave it to Neil Armstrong. And it was this guy who uh, gave that uh, nod to Armstrong. It was Deke Slayton, who was one of the original seven Mercury astronauts. Uh, never made it into space, uh, at least with the original guys, because uh, he had a heart, something wrong with his heart. Um, Dick Slayton. How do you get to the moon? Well, you get to the moon because Deke Slayton picks you. Uh, the, Apollo, uh, the Apollo project picks up in October of 1968 after three astronauts, uh, Gus Grissom, uh, Ed White, and Roger Chafee were killed uh, on the launch pad back in January 1967 in a dress rehearsal. And uh, Dick Hull uh, told me that he listened to the final uh, recordings that came out of what was called the Apollo 202 at that point. And he said, you would not want to hear it. Uh, the astronauts, uh, there was some um, oxygen that was uh, pumped into the spacecraft, pure oxygen. There was a spark and uh, within a minute they were all gone. Uh, Dick listened to that and he told me, you never want to hear that. Uh, anyway, so Slayton picks uh, Wally Shira, Don Isley, Walter Cunningham uh, as his astronauts there. Uh, Wally Shira really had some trepidations about the Apollo craft because of what happened to his friend Gus Grissom and Apollo 201. Tom Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan. Cernan, the last man to work, walk on the moon, uh, they were the backups. Apollo 8, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and, and uh, Bill Anders, William Anders. Uh, they were the crew for that, and the backup crew was uh, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Fred Hayes. And um, under normal circumstances, they would have been the Apollo 11 uh, astronauts, and it would have been Hayes, not Aldrin, walking on the moon. Apollo 9, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert, Conrad Gordon and Bean as a backup. Uh, Conrad Gordon and Bean went to the moon in Apollo 12. 
Uh, Apollo 10, well, Apollo 7 backups, uh, Stafford, Young, and Sorlin. Uh, but uh, there was a slight uh, change in terms of Apollo 11 because uh, Michael Collins, who had been injured, was coming back. And he came back and he bumped Aldrin as the command uh, module uh, pilot and Aldrin became the third guy and actually because of that would become the second guy on the moon. Uh, there was the success of Apollo 11 in December of 1968. So Deke Slayton had to figure out who's going on Apollo 11. Um, and he said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, these guys have worked hard, but we'll just make that change with Michael Collins. And after all, there was no guarantee that Apollo 11 wouldn't land on the moon. We'll just stick with the rotation. So Apollo 8's backup crew became the Apollo 11 crew with Michael Collins coming in and replacing Hayes. Hayes. And um, they knew what they were doing. They had trained for all these roles with Apollo 8, Apollo 9, so Apollo 7 in, in the training. So it was just, hey, let's put Collins back where he is mo most comfortable and we'll move Aldrin to the other uh, spot. Uh, so nobody knew who was going to be the first on the moon. I mean, yeah, there was that Kennedy goal to get to man on the moon by the end of the decade. But the end of the decade technically is 1970, not 1969. Decades start in one and end in zero, technically. Um, NASA had a tight sequencing of the missions. They were going every couple months. And uh, as long as mission objectives were accomplished, then Apollo 11 could be next on the moon. And it was Apollo 11. Uh, Armstrong takes over the landing himself. He lands at 4.15 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. There's about 25 seconds of fuel left. Armstrong announces Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Oh, by the way, while uh, Armstrong and Aldrin are walking on the moon, the Soviets, they were going to try and upstage all of this. They're going to send the satellite of their own, unmanned, unmanned, but they're going to send a satellite. It was called uh, Lunar 16. And uh, it was going to land on the moon, scoop up rocks, bring the rocks back to the Soviet Union, and hey, steal the thunder from Apollo 11. Uh, rather, it was uh, Lunar 15, not Lunar 16. That's just an image, same thing. Lunar 15 would orbit the moon at the same time as Apollo 11, and both would be sending signals back to Earth. This could have caused a problem. Could have caused a big problem because it could have interfered with Apollo 11, or Apollo 11 could have interfered with the Lunar 15. So Frank Borman, who was friendly with uh, some of the uh, Soviet cosmonauts, um, makes a call over to his friend and he says, his friend's over there and he says, listen, you know, we don't want to lose these three guys and you don't want to lose a craft. Um, you know, is this going to be a problem? And the Soviets said it wasn't and it wasn't a problem. So according to the Soviet calendar, according to the Soviet calendar, Apollo 11 takes off on July 16th. And this is the middle of the Cold War. Remember, and the space race is only a little part of the Cold War going on between the Soviets and the Americans. So Lunar 15 began circling the moon on July 17th, 1969. And uh, the Apollo is gonna get to the moon, the lunar module on July 20th. Now, if all went according to plans, the Soviet air, uh, spacecraft could be back on the Earth before the astronauts of Apollo 11 come back. So if there's some sort of failure, the Soviets win another battle in the Cold War. But um, July 21st, uh, Armstrong and uh, Aldrin are leaving the Sea of Tranquility where they landed and uh, Lunar 15 smashes into a mountain. So that's the end of the Soviets. They lose not only the race to the moon, but they lost an opportunity to get some publicity, which was a big thing during the Cold War. Uh, Dreaming of Going to the Moon, H.G. Wells. You must have this book at the library. Uh, this book's been around since um, for more than 120 years. You know, H.G. Wells had the War of the Worlds, first men in the moon. And they didn't wear spacesuits in the moon, according to H.G. Wells. But Dreaming of the Moon had been taking place for 
Oh, you know, probably going back to uh, prehistoric days. That's Robert Goddard from Massachusetts in 1926. Robert Goddard with his first rocket. Uh, Dr. Robert Hutchings Goddard, who was born in 1892, lived to 1945, is considered the father of the modern rocket propulsion. Uh, Goddard had constructed and successfully tested his first rocket using liquid fuel on March 16th, 1926 in Arbor, Massachusetts. Um, yeah, he, he had been around. People had known him because he almost blew up the basement of the Worcester Polytechnical Institute physics building uh, by building a rocket. Uh, there was a cloud of smoke from a powder-filled rocket in the basement of, of that uh, particular uh, building. Uh, in 1914, he received two U.S. patents. One was for a rocket using liquid fuel. The other was a two- or three-stage rocket using solid fuel getting to the moon. Well, it was more than a one-stage rocket to get to the moon. Goddard was right in 1914 about what it would take to get to the moon. And there is Goddard with one of his um, inventions, uh, a rocket ship. Uh, toward the end of a 1920 report, Goddard outlined the possibility of a rocket reaching the moon and exploding. He, he didn't forget about what he did down in the basement. It, ex it would explode and there'd be a loud and big load of flash powder there to mark its arrival. And maybe if you could look in the telescope, see this powder going up on the moon. But uh, he never gave up on, on that you know, big entrance, right? Ever since 1907. Uh, his rocket flight in 1929 carried the first scientific payload, a barometer and a camera. Well, the Nazis. Yeah, the Nazis, Werner von Braun, Operation Paperclip. Uh, the Nazis had developed uh, rocket technology in part thanks to Goddard uh, because they asked him some, for some advice before he realized and everybody else realized what the Nazis were all about. Uh, the V-2 rocket. Uh, Goddard largely anticipated the technical detail that would later become something of a prototype, the German V-2 missiles, including a gyroscopic control, steering by vanes in the jet stream of the rocket motor, gimbal steering, power-driven fuel pumps, and other devices. And that was the V-2 rocket that uh, Werner von Braun, among others, uh, would uh, perfect for the Nazi regime. It was launched from mobile units. Each V-2 rocket was 46 feet high, carried a ton of explosives, and was used for the first time in London, London, England, September 8th, 1944. And there are, if you go to London, there are some areas of London where you could see vestiges of, of these rockets, uh, or at least the craters. Gouged a 32-foot uh, crater, killed three people, injured 22 others. This V-2 rocket was supposed to change the tide of the war for the Nazis who were losing at this point. And uh, there is uh, some of the uh, damage that was uh, caused by that rocket back in London. Uh, it was a military weapon. You know, when we're watching the space program in the 60s, we didn't think of this as a military weapon. But it took five minutes uh, from the launch uh, to landing the Vertungswaffen, or retaliatory weapon, which was the last ditch attempt by the Germans to reverse the course of World War II. Now, who built this? Well, you could say slave labor. It was the people in the concentration camps. Prisoners? I don't know. I think they may have been more than prisoners. But anyway, uh, many of those who were uh, worked on them, on the rockets, were pulled from concentration camps. And they worked around the clock. There was an underground factory called Middle Walk near Buchenwald Concentration Camp, Central Germany. Uh, you know, it was appalling conditions without the no daylight, little sleep, food, or proper sanitation. Um, might have been a step up working in, the, in that factory building this. Um, but uh, the, the prisoners or, or the concentration camp victims um, didn't really care uh, about building this thing uh, because they wanted to uh, sabotage anything the Germans tried to do and uh, did. And uh, 
things from just urinating on uh, parts of this to make it go wrong. That's what they did. Eyewitness accounts describe prisoners as being hanged from cranes above rocket assembly lines in the event you decided to urinate on the part that could have made this thing go sideways. Um, the second guy from the right in this picture, um, take a look at that picture. Uh, the second guy from the right is Warner Von Braun, who is the father of the American space program. But he was the guy who literally was in charge of building, of, uh, building the V-2 rocket. Werner von Braun joined the Nazi party November 12th, 1937. He claimed he was coerced by the SS. Um, my friend Dick Hull kind of questions, at least von Braun's brother, whether he was coerced by the SS. And Dick worked for NASA for 15 years. Um, there is some documentation that uh, Braun didn't want his uh, rocket research used for military purposes. And he claimed that he was coerced into working with the Nazi party. Uh, and there he is again, shaking hands. Uh, there he is in that picture there uh, with top brass in Germany. Uh, the engineer who designed the V-2 was von Braun. The Allies realized that the V-2 was a machine unlike anything that they had developed by themselves. And it was, they thought, uh, a killing machine. Um, the war is coming to an end, and the Americans, the Soviets, and the British all want the V-2 technology. Uh, von Braun makes a decision. He's going to surrender to the Americans and roll the dice with the Americans. The Russians got their hands on the V-2 factory and the test range. Uh, and von Braun would be able to come to America. Here is von Braun posing with some of the... Uh, uh, astronauts, um, John Glenn is there and uh, Wally Shira is there. Uh, Operation Paperclip. And Operation Paperclip basically took Nazi scientists and others, uh, mathematicians, etc., and got them into the United States. They sent them to Texas to deprogram them at first and uh, make them work for the United States military. Operation Paperclip was an opportunity for the United States to seize on the mind power of some of the most brilliant minds who worked in Germany during World War II. In total, 1,600 German scientists, engineers, technicians went from Germany to America. The number one guy was von Braun. Uh, the Cold War in space. You know, going back when I was a kid watching, oh, there goes Gemini 8 and all this other stuff, it seemed cool. I wanted to be an astronaut. It was nothing cooler than to be an astronaut but uh, they were all military guys. And this was the Cold War. And it was the United States, the democracy, the capitalists against the communists with uh, Nikita Khrushchev threatening the, that, to get rid of America. And in the late 1950s, space would become just another arena for the competition. Each side wanted to show its superiority, its military firepower, and by extension, the political economic system in John Kennedy in the 1960 presidential campaign against Richard Nixon claimed there was a missile gap and that the United States was falling far behind the Soviets in that particular arena. After World War II, 15 years after World War II, uh, von Braun's in the United States and he's worked with the US Army on the development of ballistic missiles. That was part of uh, Project Paperclip, Operation Paperclip. And uh, he was among the uh, initial group of 125 who ended up at Fort Bliss in Texas. There, they worked on with Von Braun rockets for the US Army. There were V2 launches at the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. Uh, Von Braun would move to the Redstone Arsenal and it would be a Redstone rocket that would take uh, Alan Shepard into a suborbital flight back in 1961. And um, he continues to design um, rocket ships, the Army Redstone, the Jupiter ballistic missiles. Remember, he claimed he didn't want any of his work to go into the military, as well as the Jupiter C, the Juno 2, the Sam 1 launch vehicles. Uh, a Jupiter C orbited the first US satellite successful orbit, the Explorer 1 in 1958. And there is uh, Werner von Braun, and there is Walt Disney. And you might say, 
what is Warner Von Braun doing with Walt Disney? Why? Well, Walt Disney had a television show, The Wonderful World of Disney. And what better place for Warner Von Braun to sell the space race than to kids watching in the 1950s Disney products, whether it was on uh, ABC uh, with Mickey Mouse Club or the World of Disneyland or, 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 or Disneyland, which is what it was initially called, or the Wonderful World of Disney. Hey, go on with Walt. Walt's popular. He does things for kids. Makes sense. Von Braun was the most prominent advocate for space exploration in the United States in the 1950s. He wrote books. He wrote uh, articles for magazines when magazines mattered, which they don't today, but when, and I and my broke in first writing was with a magazine called Into Out of Business. Um, anyway, uh, for a magazine such as Collier's, which is long gone, and Von Braun served as a spokesman on three Walt Disney television programs on space travel, Man in Space, Disney's on board. You got Disney, you got the kids. Oh, that Cold War stuff, uh, we don't want to know about the Cold War. We just want to know about going into space. But the Soviets get into space first, at least with an artificial satellite, the Sputnik. Uh, and that's 1957. And um, it's no more bigger than a beach ball. Weighs about 180 pounds, stuffed with wires and stuff and these antennas. And it goes big which would become the basis of a rock and roll song uh, in the 1958, 59, 60, when writers were writing about things like beep, 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 which is the sound that, that came out of Sputnik. On October 4th, 1957, a Soviet R-7 intercontinental ballistic missile launched Sputnik, the Russian word for traveler, and the Russians have not given up on Sputnik yet because the COVID-19 vaccine that they came up with is called Sputnik 5. Sputnik 5 for their COVID-19 uh, vaccination. It was the world's first artificial satellite, first man-made object to be placed into the Earth's orbit. And uh, I was doing this talk about uh, two years ago because it coincided with the 50th anniversary of Armstrong and Aldrin walking on the moon. And um, there was this man, and, and I went around the room because when I talk, I want to see what you're thinking as well. And I asked uh, those people who were around uh, when Sputnik went up, and I said, were you concerned? And the answer was, um, uh, because these people are all in their late 70s, early 80s now, because it was 64 years ago. And um, they said, well, yeah, kind of, because they were in space. But one guy said to me, I wasn't concerned about Sputnik. Sputnik didn't bother me at all, artificial spacecraft. What concerned me living in the New York area was that intercontinental ballistic missile, because it could reach New York. It could reach Washington. That's what I was concerned about, that missile. And, um, and you know what? That's what, um, that's what people were concerned about, but not necessarily in the United States Defense Department. They were kind of happy that Sputnik went up first because, hey, we got to catch up with them. Means more money for the Pentagon. And that's what happened. They got more money. Sputnik was just an aluminum spear, size of a beach ball, four spindly legs. It uh, was, went through space for about three months and it circulated every 100 minutes. And there was this beep, 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 which you heard on rock and roll records at the time, the novelty rock and roll records. Uh, the launch of Sputnik did kick off the Cold War space race as we knew it. And the United States would eventually recover from the Soviets' early lead. An American satellite finally launched from Cape Canaveral in 1958. Okay, so what does a hockey player got to do with all this? Bill Cleary who was a member of the United States Olympic hockey team in 1956. Well, uh, in 1995 at Rockefeller Center in New York, uh, USA Hockey um, had a celebration of the 35th anniversary of the United States hockey team beating Czechoslovakia in the 1960 Squaw Valley Olympics and the 15th anniversary of the United States beating Finland, not the Soviets, beating Finland for the gold medal in the 1980 Olympics. And there were all these Olympians around, and I, I was talking to Bill Cleary, 
uh, brought my son there. He got to meet all these people. It's Rockefeller Center. He gets to skate at Rockefeller Center. He's a hockey player too. Uh, but anyway, um, so I was talking to Bill Cleary and we were talking about the 1960 Olympics and he wanted to tell me a story about 1958. I said, what happened in 1958? He said, well, you know, there was an exchange, a cultural exchange between Khrushchev and Eisenhower because they're trying to tamper down the Cold War. And uh, they figure, well, the cultural exchange, uh, we, the United States, sent a hockey team over there, sent a um, uh, uh, track and field team over there. And the Soviets sent back uh, the Bolshoi Ballet Oh, and the, the dancing bears. I used to love watching the dancing bears from the Moscow Circus on the Ed Sullivan Show. They were fun to watch, the Ed Sullivan Show. Anyway, so he said, do you ever hear about our story? I said, no, I've never heard about your story. He said, well, let me tell you about our story. I said, I'm all ears. Tell me about your story. So he says, oh, the U.S. hockey team gathers uh, in Massachusetts, and they're going to fly off to uh, Moscow. And these are a bunch of college kids, volunteer firemen. There was one guy who would turn pro, eventually Tommy Williams. Um, and uh, they're going over there and they're going to represent the United States. So they fly over there um, and they get to Moscow and uh, they're taken to their hotel, which probably looked like neo uh, classical neo-Soviet design, which probably was a rectangle square box painted in gray. I've been to St. Petersburg, I can tell you that modern neoclassical Soviet architecture. In fact, you go to Ottawa, uh, the, Russian, the Russian embassy is all, it looks like a box in gray in Ottawa down in Embassy Row. Anyway, so Cleary says, uh, so we go and you know, check into the hotel. There's this big banquet that we're going to that night. And he says, we're checking our room. You know, we check in, we check our room, check our bed, check the drapes to see if there are any bugs there, bugs being microphones and all that. And he said that we found one or two. So we knew what we were going to talk about because we're prepared for that. So we go down to the main uh, banquet room and um, it's this big, big banquet room and we're being treated as VIPs and we go to every table and this is where we're sitting. And they said, it's everything is out there, the plates, the knives, the spoons, you know, and the soup bowl. And they look down in the super bowl, soup bowl and it's a miniature Sputnik intimidation. We got into space first. You didn't. Asked Cleary, did you take it seriously? He said, nah. He said, we knew these things were going to come up at us. And, um, you know, it was just a little plastic miniature of Sputnik. But um, the United States was having trouble launching satellites uh, and they were either blow up on the spacecraft or they just wouldn't go at all. They did it first. Uh, that's Lackey of the dog. Um, and uh, he's in Sputnik too. Um, uh, rather, she's in Sputnik too. And um, there's always been, you know, there were 36 dogs chosen to go into the Sputnik. They chose this dog and they knew that they were sending the dog on a suicide uh, mission, but they wanted to test it. And uh, they claimed that, um, well, they knew the dog was gonna die and they claimed that the dog died after about a week in orbit. But in 2002, Moscow's Institute for Biological Problems leaked the story that the dog died within hours of takeoff because of panic and overheating. Uh, Sputnik 2 continued to orbit the Earth for five months and then burnt up when it re-entered the atmosphere. The official story is that the dog died painlessly. The unofficial story, which was printed by BBC was that the dog died because she couldn't take uh, the uh, launch. Vanguard. Well, there's some of the failures of the United States. There's a Vanguard craft going up. Uh, the first uh, response was to accelerate the Vanguard program, which was a joint National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Navy Research Laboratory project, and that uh, was uh, a failure, December 6th. Um, the Vanguard TV-3 blew up on the path. By that time, well, Lackey went up, Sputnik 2 was up, um, and the United States, uh, there's a gap. There's a big gap. Although, like I said, the Defense Department wasn't too worried because they were going to get money. Explorer 1, January 31st, 1958, gets into space. 
and gets into an orbit. Uh, the U.S. designed the Explorer 1 that was launched by the U.S. Army under the direction of Werner von Braun. That year, 1958, Dwight Eisenhower signed a public order creating the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, federal agency dedicated to space exploration. The first man in space was Yuri Gagarin in 1961, the Soviets. Uh, 1959, the Soviet space program launched Lunar 2. That hit the moon, planned hit of the moon just to get there. April 1961, Gagarin became the first person to orbit the Earth, traveling in a capsule-like spacecraft called Vostok 1. In 1959, the Mercury astronaut uh, Shara uh, is over there along with Alan Shepard. Shara is holding uh, what would be the Mercury uh, rocket ship with the Redstone uh, uh, payload. And uh, next to him, Alan Shepard, then Gus Grissom, Deke Slayton in the middle, John Glenn. Uh, Scott Carpenter and Gordon Cooper holding the uh, nosecraft of the uh, Mercury spacecraft. Um, they're being introduced to America. April 9th, 1959, Malcolm S. Carpenter, Leroy G. Cooper, John H. Glenn, Virgil I. Gus Grissom, Walter Wally Schirra from Oradell, New Jersey. I see that plaque when I'm over there. Alan B. Shepard and Donald K. Slayton, Deke Slayton. Overnight, they are American heroes without doing anything. They were such heroes that they're on the cover of Life magazine. First reports by the astronauts starting the continuing exclusive stories on the Apollo mission, one of seven, first American in space, and that is September 14th, 1959. These guys were rock stars. These guys were on the same level as Elvis at that point. Well, Elvis was in the army, so they were probably more popular than Elvis at that point. Um, how do you go about getting an astronaut? Do you take a, a one ad out in the Chicago Tribune or the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times, um, you know, or the, or the uh, papers in Washington, including uh, at that time, the Washington Post, there were a couple other papers that never didn't make it in Washington. Well, no one knew how you select an astronaut. I mean, how do you go about selecting an astronaut? Uh, let me see what's in chat. Oh, the classic picture. Oh, um, yes. Anyway, so how do you go about it? How do you go about it? Well, you know, how do you go about it? Nobody knew. How do you go about it? Who makes the best astronauts? Well, daredevil, daredevils would be good. Um, high risk professionals living on high doses of testosterone, obtained up. Yeah, that would be the best. Uh, so let's go out and let's start looking and looking and looking, but they couldn't find any. And then they said, you know what? You know, we got a military, we got test pilots. Let's see who wants to go with the test pilots. And that's what they did. They got test pilots because you, how do you, how do you go? This job didn't exist. How do you go about hiring somebody for a job that didn't exist? Oh, Ham, Ham the chimp. Oh, good old Ham. Um, they had to select chimps too. And Ham got up uh, into space before Alan Shepard did for the Americans. Um, a two-year-old chimpanzee, Ham, uh, July 1959, uh, they picked him. I don't know if he went through the process of one ads or not, but uh, he was trained to do some simple things like, uh, well, responding to lights and sounds. During his pre-training, uh, Ham was taught to push a lever within five seconds of seeing a blue light. Uh, the failure to do so, he got a shock at the soles of his feet. But, 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 you know what? He gets it right. He gets a banana pellet. Hey, he worked for bananas. Uh, he wasn't uh, just a passenger. The results from his test flight led to Alan Shepard's mission on February, uh, rather May 5th, 1961, aboard the Freedom 7. <laughs> you look at it. He's, he's a happy chip, isn't he? He's a really happy chip. Space chip lives. <laughs> Space chip lives. Like Chewy, uh, Dewey defeats Truman, right? Same picture. Hey, look at him. He's so happy the space chimp lives. Paves the way for flight by man. And there is Eisenhower. He's given some sort of citation or medal to uh, Von Braun, who uh, is going up the ladder in uh, American politics. Uh, Eisenhower transfers the Rocket Development Center to Redstone Arsenal from the Army to NASA. The primary object? 
to develop a giant satin rocket. Right there, Mr. President, right there. You sure in warming? Yes, right there, that's the moon. Take off your sunglasses, you'll see the moon. That's what's gonna take us to the moon. And there is uh, Von Braun with John Kennedy. We're going to the moon. Von Braun became the director of the Marshall Space Center and chief architect of the Saturn V launch vehicle, uh, the Marshall Space uh, Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, the super booster that would propel Americans to the moon. That's one of Von Braun's rockets taking a uh, Mercury spacecraft uh, into uh, orbit. Uh, that's the Redstone, and that's with Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard, suborbital mission, 15 minutes. Uh, Alan Shepard, who was cracking on the uh, launch pad that day, back in 1961, that uh, do you realize, because it's the government, do you realize that I'm sitting on a pack payload of lowest bidders, because government has to take the lowest bid for their projects. Uh, he also had to uh, go to the bathroom and there was delays and delays and delays and he wanted to come down. They said, no, nah, no can do, sit there, whatever you do, you'll take care of it after you get back. Alan Shepard. Uh, to space, the Marshall Group continued to work on the Redstone Mercury, the rocket that sent Shepard into a suborbital flight. And it's a success and there is Alan Shepard after he's picked up while he's floating in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, looking into uh, Freedom 7, the craft that uh, he would uh, pilot. Uh, Shepard would have an ear, inner ear problem and would be grounded for many, time, uh, many years. He would come back in 1971 with Apollo 14, land on the moon, and uh, not only did he land on the moon, he took a golf club with him. Um, the Hidden Figures, I'm sure in the library you have the uh, book Hidden Figures or you have the movie Hidden Figures, Katherine Johnson. Dick Hall knew uh, Katherine Johnson, he knew all the women who were involved in the Hidden Figures. Um, he said they weren't hidden. Everybody knew who they were. They were just not given a high profile until 1962 with John Glenn. And uh, there was some thought of getting rid of uh, those women, but John Glenn insisted he wanted them around and he's gonna do the first uh, uh, spacecraft with an orbit and Katherine Johnson uh, is part of that package. She also was the mathematician who figured out how to get to the moon. And there is John Glenn, uh, Friendship 7, who's about ready to go into orbit. John Glenn asked the engineers to get the girls because they were going through some data beforehand. Get the girl, the girl, Katherine Johnson, to run the same numbers. Uh, through the equations that had been programmed into a computer, but by hand on her desktop mechanical calcul uh, calculating machine. Uh, if she says they're good to go, Katherine Johnson remembers Glenn saying, then I'm ready to go. You're good to go. John Glenn went. Katherine Johnson uh, helped uh, sync the Apollo, uh, Project Apollo lunar lander with uh, the uh, command service module. She would stay with NASA until uh, 1986. She had been at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia since 1953. She was given the Presidential uh, 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 Freedom Medal uh, by Barack Obama. Uh, Katherine Johnson recently passed away. Mary Jackson, another one of the hidden figures, along with Dorothy Vaughn. Uh, the goals were simple. Get through the uh, Mercury program, go on to Germany, and then land man on the moon. The goals that were meet are met with Mercury, place a manned spacecraft into orbital flight around the Earth. Investigate man's performance capabilities and his ability to function in the environment of space starting with a 15-minute flight, ending with a day-long flight, 1963, by Gordon Cooper, recover the man and spacecraft safely. Uh, then it's Gemini and getting man out of the craft and floating around in space like uh, Richard Gordon does in this flight. Richard Gordon ended up being the general manager of the New Orleans Saints National Football League team. I have no idea what kind of talent evaluator he was in football, but took the Saints forever to get the right guy in there to build a football team. Gemini had four goals, test an astronaut's ability to fly long duration missions up to two weeks in space to understand how spacecraft could rendezvous and dock in orbit around the earth and the moon. 
to uh, perfect reentry and landing methods and to further understand the effects of long space flights on astronauts. There was one mission that lasted 14 days. And there is the Gemini spacecraft. Uh, that was Gemini uh, 6 and 7 when they rendezvous in space and uh, beat Army in, is in the window. Uh, the Gemini program consisted of 19 launches, two initial uncrewed test missions, seven target vehicles, the Aegean and 10 crewed missions, each carried two astronauts into Earth orbit. It was designed as a bridge between the Mercury and Apollo programs. And uh, John Kennedy uh, initially looked at this saying, why do we need two years between um, Mercury and Gemini? And he was getting very upset that uh, things weren't going faster to get man on the moon. Of course, he's assassinated on uh, November 22nd, 1963. Meanwhile, the Soviets, so uh, they're in space. They got their spacecrafts going. Lunar 2 was the first uh, human-made object to crash into the moon, 1959. Other lunar missions included uh, the first lunar flybys, photographs of the far side, back side of the moon. Meanwhile, the Americans are trying with the Pioneer spacecraft, uh, Pioneer Zero, one and two, first lunar attempts, all failed, all failed, followed by Apollo, uh, rather uh, Pioneer 3, 4. Uh, number four succeeded in becoming America's first successful lunar mission. Ranger 7 was sent to take pictures and then crash into the moon, and they took pictures of possible landing spots. It took pictures of possible landing spots on the moon. The Ranger program, as Dick Hall said, very, very important. Dick said this may have been more important than the, the manned missions. Uh, the Ranger program was a series of unmanned space missions. Uh, the object obtained first up close images of the surface of the moon. Uh, and that's all it was. It was designed to take images of the moon and then it would crash into the moon. Uh, and there were problems. Uh, there were mishaps. The first six missions, all were failures. All were failures, but they finally got one. Surveyor program. Uh, this landed uh, a craft on the moon. And again, Dick said it was very, very important because they had no idea if you could do anything on the moon. This thing landed on the moon and uh, did some experimentation. Uh, seven unmanned lunar missions uh, between May of 66, January of 68, Surveyor 3, 5, 6, and 7 successfully soft landed on the lunar surface and um, American uh, engineers and uh, American scientists got an idea of what uh, the surface of the moon was like. Oh, there's my friend Ole. Um, I, I don't know if he's on. I don't know if he's watching on YouTube, but he'll see this. Uh, Orly is on the right, and that's his father on the left. Uh, a few years ago, we were on a uh, speaking on a cruise ship, and I was doing my thing, which I don't even remember what my thing is. And Orly was talking about uh, his space museum in Iceland, and uh, and how the Apollo ash or the future Apollo astronauts would practice um, maneuvers, uh, whatever the maneuvers would be in Iceland, because that was about as close as you were going to get to conditions on the moon on Earth. Uh, this is 2015. Uh, the Armstrong family, Neil Armstrong's um, heirs and his, and his family there at uh, the um, opening of Orly's uh, museum, the Space Exploration Museum, uh, and uh, if you're interested in all the things that went on in Ireland, there's his website, www.explorationmuseum.com. Uh, Orly told me that uh, in 2015, he led an expedition of Apollo astronauts, Walter Cunningham, Rusty Schweiker, and Harrison Schmidt, as well as the family of uh, Neil Armstrong to uh, the new laver of Hulenran, uh, which wasn't there. <laughs> Uh, there was, um, you know, uh, you know uh, Iceland's filled with volcanoes, and this one sprouted up, and uh, this was created by uh, a fissure, the eruptions in 2014 and 2015. And um, there is uh, there's the bus and the tour of the land that uh, Orly took uh, them in 2015. Orly, if you're out there, thank you for uh, helping me out on this talk, uh, along with uh, Dick Hall. Um, Iceland. Um, 
Orly has led uh, similar expeditions with uh, Apollo astronauts, uh, Bill Anders. Now these guys are in their 80s and 90s now. So this was the last go around really for them. Uh, and Charlie Duke in areas near uh, Ashka. Uh, that's a culture situated in the remote part of the central highlands of Iceland. That's where the astronauts trained in 65 and 67 before the lunar missions. And uh, I'm not sure how much training from what I've been told that they did. They did a lot of fishing, did a lot of fun things, didn't do all that much training according to Orly's father. Gus Grissom is to the left. Uh, that is Ed White to the center and Roger Chafee uh, on the right. Um, and they are the Apollo 202 astronauts. And um, they are supposed to be flying in February of 1967 and um, get prepare for the Apollo astronauts eventually to go to the moon. Doesn't work. Apollo 1 or 202 was supposed to be the first low earth orbital test uh, and was scheduled to launch February 21st. But there was a cabin fire during the launch rehearsal uh, test, Cape Kennedy on uh, January 27th, killed all three members, uh, Grissom, White and Chafee destroyed the command module. And um, like I said, Dick heard the, uh, Dick Hall heard the tapes. He said, you don't want to hear them in the last 60 seconds of, of their lives. Um, Dick said that uh, they wanted to make this as flight-like as possible. And he said, they never should have. He said, simulate it, simulate it. You didn't have to do this. Didn't have to pour the pure oxygen in there didn't have to do it. High concentrations of uh, oxygen. There was a spark and the thing blew up and it, when it became an inferno. Uh, the failures, the failures, uh, the vehicle's hatch designed to open inwards. Well, that's 90 seconds. They didn't have 90 seconds. The flames engulfed the spacecraft and searing heat inside the capsule caused the air pressure to rise. The, air, the astronauts couldn't open the hatch. Uh, 30 seconds later, the spacecraft just Im imploded, and um, they all died of asphyxiation in less than a minute. That is the aftermath. And uh, Dick Hole said, didn't have to be this one. Didn't have to be it at all. So Matt NASA says, uh, you know what? No man flights for a while, which puts the Kennedy timetable at risk here. Uh, if you're suspending things for as long as you're suspending, you cannot get into space. Uh, the accident was investigated. Dick said that uh, there wasn't much to investigate. They knew it was the oxygen. Uh, and they knew that they had to make improvements inside the spacecraft with safety procedures. Uh, and there were some uh, untest, unmanned test flights of the Saturn V rocket. And the lunar modules were made over in Long Island. And that is Apollo 1. That was the aftermath of Apollo 1. Uh, the Apollo 1 fire threw everything for a loop. NASA was dealing with a loss of the crew, and at the same time, they have to do some significant redesigns. Michael Collins, who circled the moon in uh, 1969, said at the time, without Apollo 1 and the lessons learned from it, in all probability, such a fire would have taken place later in flight. Not only the crew, but the entire spacecraft would have been lost. NASA with no machinery to examine, could only guess at the causes and how to prevent still another occurrence. Yes, Apollo 1 did cause three deaths, but I believe it saved more than three later. The crew of Apollo 7, that looks so 1960s, doesn't it? It looks so 1960s. Wally Schirra, Walter Cunningham, and uh, Isley. Um, Apollo 7 goes into space in uh, October of 1968. Shira was not the happy camper at that point. There are arguments whether we should launch at all. And then, okay, if we're in space, you know, do we really want to do a TV broadcast? This is 1968. They didn't have all those channels today that need needed to be filled, right? Uh, complaints about the food, unhappiness with the spacesuits. It took 30 minutes to get the spacesuits off to use the restroom. Sharab was at the center of the disputes as he is in the center of this picture. Um, but he goes up there, they fulfill all the Apollo 1's missions of testing the Apollo command and service module. 
in low Earth orbit, Shira would quit and then become a guy on TV with Walter Cronkite. Earthrise, there you see the Earthrise from the moon and the Apollo 8. We go to the moon, May 25th, 1961, John F. Kennedy. And that's Frank Borman on the left, Bill Anders in the center, and Tom Hanks on the right, well, rather Jim Lovell on the right. Tom Hanks would play Jim Lovell in Apollo 13. And Jim Lovell would play an older astronaut in Apollo 13, the movie done by Opie, Ron Howard. Apollo 8's mission profile was changed in 1968 because the lunar module was not ready. It probably was on the Long Island Expressway going down 95 to Cape Canaveral and hit traffic or whatever. Uh, so instead of not being ready, what are we going to do? Well, let's go fly to the moon. Come fly with me, Frank Sinatra, come fly with me. And to, um, you know, so we're going to the moon. We're going to go around the moon. And they did. And you got pictures like this from Bill Anders, the whole Earth. And on Christmas Eve, 1968, the three Apollo 8 astronauts read passages from the Bible, from Genesis, as they circled the moon. Uh, Dick told me, Dick Holt told me that uh, that particular mission, Apollo 8, because they read passages from the Bible, got far more mail than Neil Armstrong landing on the moon with Buzz Aldrin. That was the most popular, at least mail-wise, of the flights. The lunar module would debut eventually on Apollo 9, uh, the third crew mission, uh, and the first with the lunar module. The uh, commander, James McDivitt, the uh, Command module pilot David Scott and uh, Rusty Schweikert sent, spent 10 days in low Earth orbit, and they tested out aspects critical to landing on the moon, including the uh, lunar module engines, backpack life supports, navigation systems, and docking maneuvers. Apollo 10, Thomas Stafford, John Young, Gene Cernan. Young and Cernan would be uh, moonwalkers eventually. Uh, and there's a picture from taken by John Young of the uh, lunar module coming back uh, to the uh, command module after it goes within eight miles of the surface of the moon. It was a dress rehearsal, April 18th, 1969. It launched Charlie Brown and Snoopy, Charles Schultz. Uh, and uh, it proved that um, everything worked on the lunar module the way it was supposed to be, uh, except not landing on the moon. Maybe jettisoned the bottom and went back to the top. Apollo 11, July 16th, 1969. And there he finally is. He finally makes his appearance, Dick Hull. Uh, and Dick told me this incredibly wild story. He's down in Australia and he's part of the, he's, he's a video guy. And we worked together on, on a couple of projects about 10 years ago, video projects about 10 years ago. So he's telling me the story about uh, being in Australia, the land down under. Take a look at that picture. Take a look at that picture. I'll give you a second to take a look at the picture and I'm gonna ask you a question if you wanna answer it in chat. Feel free to answer it in chat. Uh, if you saw a picture like this and they said that uh, man has landed on the moon and uh, that's the first image you see of Neil Armstrong going up the ladder instead of down the ladder, what would you think? I'll give you 30 seconds uh, if you want to put something in there. I got one in chat. I think real or not real. Hang on, let's open this up. Uh, the classic picture. Okay, video from Australia. So the land down under, right? But do you, would you think that this was legitimate or was the staged? Yes or no? I'll give you another two seconds or so to answer that. I think it's staged, yes or no? Because I'm going to tell you Dick's story. Dick is down in Australia. He's at the tracking center down in Australia, and they're getting the video coming in. And of course, they're seeing the video before they release it to the public. But uh, there is audio transmission going on. So they know there's audio transmission. So they got to sync up the picture. And it's about 30 seconds before 600 million people around the world are supposed to see Neil Armstrong come down the ladder and jump off the, uh, the ladder and put his foot down uh, and uh, walk on the moon. And Dick notices that the video is upside down. And uh, the commander there, whoever that was, uh, is looking, so we got a problem here. I know how to fix it. I'm going to go get a mirror and we'll just reverse it. Nobody will know it. And the commander says, uh, if you do that, I'm going to fire you on the spot. 
And Dick said, well, if I don't do that, you're going to be the laughing stock of the world. And uh, so Dick remembered something at almost the last second possible. This is new, there's a new technology system that they're using for the first time. They worked on it, they're using it for the first time. I wonder, did anybody put it back into the place it was supposed to be? And he looks at the video system, flips the switch, and voila, you get, you get, come on, you get, you get, oh, you get that. Well, you you get um, you get the picture, not quite that clear, but of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. And um, Dick laughs at it these days, but uh, it was pretty serious back on uh, July 21st, 1969. That was, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's the next day in the land down under Australia. So, you know, Armstrong and Aldrin get on the moon. And, you know, the United States, the United States spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on an ad. Uh, <laughs> I want my MTV, MTV launches, and that's how MTV launched in 1981 with Neil Armstrong looking at an MTV flag on the moon. Oh, one of the uh, cartoons that came out uh, around uh, July 21st, 22nd, and you have to be a Honeymooners fan or Jackie Gleason's fan to understand this, because when I did this last year, there were younger people there, and they didn't get it. You know, Ralph Cramden to Alice Cramden. One of these days, Alice, one of these days, bang, zoom to the moon. So some cartoonists decided, uh, hey, we're not the first here. It's Alice Cramden. <laughs> that was humor back in 1969. November uh, 14th, the launch of, a, of uh, Apollo 12. Uh, Pete Conrad there and uh, Gordon and Bean, Gordon the NFL, <laughs> the NFL general manager eventually in New Orleans. Um, Surveyor 3 was in the vicinity uh, where Apollo 12 landed. And uh, there, you, there you see, uh, when they looked to see what kind of damage uh, was uh, happened um, in terms of erosion and things uh, to that spacecraft. The Apollo program would continue through 1972, six missions successful. Apollo 13 never made it to the moon because of an onboard explosion, but it won some Academy Awards. Space exploration, always on people's mind. Buck Rogers, or in the cartoons, Duck Dodgers with Daffy Duck. Uh, Larry Crab, Buster Crab, the swimmer, he was uh, Buck Rogers. No Bucks, no Buck Rogers. In March 1970, less than a year after the first space landing, Nixon signed a directive making space just another program that would compete for funding. You know what happened? Falling television ratings for the Apollo 12. The TV ratings dropped for Apollo 12. That's what happened. Interest in television ratings for subsequent Apollo launches dwindled. The final three moon missions were scrapped, just like a TV show canceled in mid-production. We don't need you anymore. Goodbye, see you later. And the program ended with Apollo 17 in 1972. Alan Shepard did play golf on the moon. Well, he didn't play golf on the moon, but uh, he had a golf ball, which as far as he knows, he didn't know where it landed. February 6, 1971, he pulls a makeshift six iron and he smuggled, I don't think he smuggled it, nor the dick, on board uh, on Apollo 14, hit two golf balls on the lunar surface and became the first person that we know of and maybe the only person to ever play golf somewhere else than the Earth. The last lunar landing, December 11th, 1972, uh, that's a number of years ago when the Apollo spacecraft uh, was sitting in the Smithsonian, the Apollo 11 spacecraft, and uh, it was, it's been refurbished. It was taken on the road uh, and ended uh, its road trip uh, in Seattle in 2019. Oh, the um, Soviets did finally land on the moon September 20th, 1970. This is after three missions. Um, it was fine. Um, but uh, it just didn't measure up. Um, Apollo astronauts had uh, taken, actually it was two missions because Apollo 14 was in 71. By this time, the four Apollo astronauts brought back 120 pounds of rock and dust, lunar 16, just 3.5 ounces. All that money for 3.5 ounces. Uh, they were still uh, shooting uh, rockets at the moon, 1976, lunar 24. 
was the last of the lunar series and only the third successful Soviet mission to return lunar soil samples from the moon. Uh, since then, going to the moon, Soviet Union, the United States, European Space Agency, Japan, India, the People's Republic of China and Israel have attempted uh, missions to the moon. Uh, it's been um, visited by five spacecrafts, which passed by it. Uh, four spacecrafts um, used it for some gravity assistance and also a radio telescope. That is the former director of uh, Cape Canaveral, James Kennedy, Jim Kennedy, uh, with me back uh, about five years ago, and uh, we were talking about uh, what the future uh, holds for space. Uh, he was a lecturer on um, celebrity cruises for about two years talking about space race. Uh, he was in 2003, the eighth director, became the eighth director of the Kennedy Space Center. He thinks public-private partnerships will be the key to space exploration in the future, which it probably will be, as uh, Elon Musk is doing. Uh, and uh, the Trump administration had a goal of returning to the moon in 2024. And of course, there's always, let's go to Mars. Uh, Samantha, thank you for inviting me. And thank you to the DeKalb Library. Uh, that's why I spoke at the George Bush Presidential Library. Your tax dollars at work. The State Department hired me for a talk on the politics of sports business in August of uh, 2007. So you're... <laughs> Your tax dollars at work. They spent it on me. I was the one who was uh, representing the government. Anyway, thank you, Samantha. The floor is all yours. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Evan. That was um, really enlightening um, and in depth. So, if anybody has. Thank you, Daniel. I see you clapping. I see yeah, we, we clapping. like it when people are on screen clapping. So, that's <laughs> wonderful. Um, if anybody has any questions for Evan, go or ahead. Comments. Or comments. Yeah, or comments. comments. Anything you want to say. You're able to unmute yourself um, if you'd like. If you'd prefer, you can type a question or a comment into the chat function for Evan to read. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, um, I've been interested since growing up. I was, of course, taken in by the, the whole razzle-dazzle of the space race and it's exploring space. But looking at the domestic politics of it, LBJ was the congressional chairman of the what, aeronautics committee or something for years. So he was yeah. into space exploration, unlike Kennedy, who was into one up upping the, yeah. the Soviet. And it's not a coincidence that all of the most important NASA bases are below the Mason Dixon line. Houston, like, Florida, yeah. uh, Alabama. That's not a coincidence. That was LBJ's Southern southern strategy. Mississippi also, you go right over the uh, Louisiana line and to the, to the Stennis Space Center as well, since I've been there, so. But no, I mean, you know, uh, well, first of all, your launches have to be in a warm weather place. Right. So that would preclude the, the North, but yeah, I mean, you know, look, um, Von Braun started out in Fort Bliss, Texas and his, uh, you know, it's funny talking to Dick, um, and, and obviously I've spent a lot of time talking to Dick. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Kathy, I appreciate that. Uh, Dick, Dick said, you know, it, it was the Germans who, who basically, it was the German scientists who, who were responsible to at least get Alan Shepard up and to get you know, the craft to the moon. Nixon had no interest in space. In fact, you know, the story is that there were two speeches he prepared. One was to congratulate Armstrong and Aldrin. The other was, uh, thank you for your service to the country. Um, and thank you for uh, giving up your life to, for science. But Nixon really didn't care. Nixon was an uh, oddball. I mean, I knew Nixon because of, uh, I'll talk about Space Force in a second. I knew Nixon because of the Major League Baseball umpires dispute in 1985. He was the arbitrator and I got to deal with him. And that was one of the things that brought him back into proper society as an elder statesman. So I dealt with him for about four years. His office was down in Foley Square next to the Southern District Court in New York. Uh, Nixon, by the time I knew him, was very uninterested in politics or anything else. All he wanted to do is watch a baseball game. <laughs> That's all he wanted to do. So uh, that was it. Uh, so, but yeah, you were right about the razzle dazzle. Hey, the astronauts drink Tang. Maybe I should drink Tang. Remember Tang? 
my opinion on the Space Force, well, it's always been about the military. It's always been about, uh, which wasn't sold to us as kids, or certainly Disney didn't sell it with Werner von Braun uh, back in the 1950s when, when he hosted the three TV shows. It's always been about space. It's always been about controlling space. And, you know, the Space Force is what, just uh, another, and we got spy satellites up there. So what's, what's the big deal that we're taking another, could take another step? I mean, you know, that's the way it is. It's, it's part of the military. Um, um, and that's, even though it was sold to us, it's not. So that's my opinion anyway. We're up there anyway. They're up there anyway. Chinese, China is up there. Everybody's spying on everybody else, right? So that's just an extension of it. So will will NASA become way more um, like um, research based then, in your opinion, versus military and defensive? It's always been military. All their astronauts and their astronauts to this day are military people. It's always right. been military. They came out of the military. Right. That's my understanding. So that's why I'm confused. Why we have space force? So I'm wondering if that's going to force <laughs> NASA into becoming more of research based. No, I doubt it. I, I doubt it. Uh, remember what Eisenhower said back on January 17th, 1961, about the military industrial complex? And, uh, you know, look, the Defense Department welcomed Sputnik, welcomed it because more money for us, more money for us. And that's where the money went. Yeah, you know, it's all about money. You know, Space Force, NASA, NASA struggles to get money at this point. Um, you know, we didn't even have a space shuttle, right? We had no, we're using the Soviets technology up there. Uh, what Jim said basically is it's going to become a public partner, public private partnership. That's what Jim, Jim thought, Jim Kennedy, who was at the end of that talk, thought it was going to be that um, you're going to see more and more private money sunk into space. NASA will be there. Tra they need training, but uh, it's still a mil military project. Daniel. Yeah, I, I did want to, just want to check in here, uh, put my two cents in. Uh, Eisenhower was very careful to establish NASA as a civilian organization because the pretense has always been that NASA is civilian. Therefore, the stuff we're sending up there is for pure scientific research. And yeah, we've got the military and we share the equipment, but one is for peaceful exploration and the other is for purely defensive purposes. Yep. Nothing aggressive, right? Nothing, nothing offensive. And there have been countless, endless negotiations to put together a treaty uh, that would guarantee the non-militarization of space and only countries like Mauritania sign it. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, I do think what we're gonna see is a lot of debate, not terribly public debate because there are other things going on in politics right now. But the role of NASA uh, uh, as sort of a mediator between the private and the public sector, that NASA will be like the traffic cops. They'll be the, the people that uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, they explore the territory and the private guys come in and dig the canals and build the trains. That's that's what Jim, that's what yeah. uh, Kennedy, Jim Kennedy said, that uh, that's what he gives. I don't know if he's doing talks right now or not, but he gives a lot of talks about the future, which I've sat and watched. And uh, the excitement is, is that uh, you'll have the Musks and others uh, out there uh, putting up the crafts and um, you're right. I mean, NASA will be kind of the traffic cop there saying, yeah, we want this, we want that. But he thinks it, within a couple of generations, most of the space explorations will be paid for by private because they're gonna to wanna to develop. No, they're gonna develop. I mean, I was reading that you could take a one-way trip to Mars now. Mm -hmm. I don't expect you to come back. Uh, but you know, there is there will be entrepreneurs out there who's going to try, who will try to figure out some angle. Yeah, I think actually maybe the first thing I have actually suggested this to people: they should identify an asteroid that has this beautiful opalescent, you know, <laughs> mineral in the interior and deorbit it, and then sell cufflinks and beads and whatnot. You could make a billion dollars selling space jewelry 
if you had a certificate of authenticity that said this used to be an asteroid. Let's capture it and bring it home. Yep. Give it away on the TV show, right? Mm -hmm. Have a contest, you know. Yep. <laughs> Does anybody else have any comments or questions? If uh, you open your chat function, you'll notice that I put a link to um, our feedback survey for today's event um, in there. Again, very brief. Um, we appreciate any feedback that you want to give us. Um, we use it to uh, schedule upcoming programs. So we, we do listen to what you have to say. Thank you, Virginia. I appreciate it. All right. I want to thank Samantha for inviting me. I gave her some ideas from, for some other talks. In the future. Thank you, Evan. Yeah, this has been this has been great. Um, and then the, the doing the presidential impact on sports that was wonderful too. So we were very very glad to have you for thank more you. than one program. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you everybody for coming. And thank you for everybody who has watched on Facebook. We are recording the program, so we'll put it up on our YouTube channel on Monday, um, and we'll put a link to it on our website as well. So if you couldn't make it today. Um, or if you couldn't make all of the program today, since you are listening to me right now, um, please feel free to, to watch it at your own pace. All right, everybody, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And thank you, Evan. And thank you, Samantha, and thank you for attending and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you liked some of the backstories uh, of people who I knew. Uh, <laughs> Dick, Dick Orley and, uh, and Jim. So uh, I have to thank Dick Orley and Jim for helping me out with the talk as well. So thank you. Have a good day. I'm going outside to enjoy the sunshine of what's <laughs> left of the sunshine as the wind has died down. Thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with me. My name is Evan Weiner. Thank you. And maybe we'll see you down the line. Have a good one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>